We'll probably get started here in just a few seconds. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll still kind of flip through it. Cool. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is the uh, DevOps for the Discouraged talk. So if you're here for something else, you know, it's fair heads up. Um, okay. Well, um, my name is James Wickett. I, uh, I live in Austin, Texas. I uh, work at a company called Signal Sciences, which is a startup. Uh, and I do stuff around rugged dev. Um, I work on a project called Gauntlet. Uh, and we, uh, we have a uh, security conference in Austin called Last Week. Um, the, uh, the company I work for is, uh, is Signal Sciences. We're making an app set uh, effective, effective and practical. Um, if you're interested in it, you can just get on our website. So we're kind of in, uh, in uh, startup mode right now. So. Uh, okay, here's the great news. Like I realize some people here are from the East Coast, and it's like I'm just going to tune out. It's like dinner time, whatever. So uh, here you can like download the slides right now, and then so you'll get all that content. Um, and uh, you'll just be ready to coast through the rest of this, and like, later you can be like, what, what was that guy talking about? And you can, you can refer back to it. And I wanted to give you some fair warning, but like, uh, you know, Sky Mall going away is really sad. And um, so, so it's the, um, it's, it's the actually, in my seat on the flight over here, there was no Sky Mall, and I was a little confused by it. I don't know if they've taken it out of the airplanes. Have they done that? Is that? Yeah, I don't know. My two year old's going to be really upset because I, I use that to tell other stories on the airplane. Um, Anyway, so I've decided to take uh, SkyMall uh, photos and put them throughout the whole deck. So that this is going to be the start of it. Um, well, this one is really from Austin. That's why you might have known. Uh, but if you find yourself in Austin, uh, we'd love to have you come out to Austin OWASP for the uh, last Tuesday of the month. And uh, we also have LastCon, which is uh, much like this conference. Uh, and it's uh, the uh, last Thursday and Friday of October, as long as it doesn't compete with Halloween. So you can kick it a week earlier. So I'd say we have to put that on the radar. Um, also to save you some headache, because if you're like, hmm, not sure, maybe there's another talk I want to go to, I'm going to give you the conclusions up front. So if uh, you want to just uh, coast through the rest of the talk that way or whatever, it's cool too. So uh, here's some conclusions. Uh, hopefully that we'll arrive at uh, together. Now, it's really easy to just get discouraged in our industry, but uh, I think there is hope. Agile DevOps and continuous delivery practices have an impact uh, for the way we do application security and information security. Uh, I think that we're behind right now, uh, but I think there's some really good opportunities for us to add value uh, in the organization, especially for moving towards kind of more of a DevOps and uh, um, I, I think the integrated inside of the build pipeline and uh, the operational tooling uh, really is a win. And I think that uh, unit and integration tests, they're good, but they're not enough. We need to like work on putting tests that uh, focus on attack tooling uh, and things like that inside of our, our pipelines and deployments. Um, 
All right, so audience uh, survey here. And it's not, what is this guy doing? Because I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it's a hair growing product. Um, for those that just walked in, we're doing a memorial to Sky Mall as well throughout the deck. So um, anyway, so this you can answer the next couple questions, not as yourself, but as a person you maybe knew at a previous company, because I realize you might be sitting next to coworkers or bosses or stuff like that. So answer honestly for you at a previous company, right? So uh, do you feel unable to cause change in your organization, positive change in your organization? Have you ever felt that before, been that way? No, your friends, your friends in that other company, have they ever felt that way? Yeah, okay. okay. Um, have you ever felt that security is left out of important uh, engineering decisions or business decisions? Okay, yep. Um, have you ever reported a serious internal vulnerability only to see uh, six months uh, or more later? Okay, lots of answer that. Okay, so that's why we're here. Um, your boss probably thinks you're here for this. Um, but but we are we're here uh, because we want to talk about like what are we actually doing in the organization. Um, I think that we could say like humans optimize for the probable, and like that's like sort of like philosophical. Right? So you can say okay, we optimize for the probable, and we do so when we do we talk about things like doing unit testing, like we understand like oh these are the flows we want to look at, or if we look at things like integration testing, um, when we start trying to go you know into um, and. You know, we call those things like happy path engineering or whatever, right? You could think of, you know, the optimal user flows. And then um, there's also the, the tendency to optimize for the, po the possible. And there's a difference there. Like, um, people call this over-engineering. It's where you do stress and load testing. Obviously, you don't do it on everything, but on the stuff that you're really sure that, you know, might happen, right? But you, you sort of, like, you sort of craft this scenario in your, in your mind. And so we sort of live in this the balance between these two. And I think we actually live in the ba balance of where we sit. We try to really optimize, if you're doing, trying to do good engineering, you're trying to like, look at what's actually possible, um, and, but not just, not just possible, but like, how you perceive what's really going to be probable. So you try not to like, build too much, you know, but you try to like, build, build slightly different than what, what you think, but you're still kind of scoped like, your perception, and that's, a, that's pretty important. And it really starts begging the question, of, like, how do you even perceive what is probable, how do we know what, what we're doing. Um, and I think this is this could be like categorized as the epistemological um, problem of software development. Um, two points for using the word epistemological in a talk and trying to pronounce it correctly, right? Syllables. Um, okay, so uh, but we we attempt to solve it. Uh, we we attempt to solve this by by gathering rhetoric and data to try to support our conclusions. And you're probably in meetings like that where it's like, yes, we must do this because and there's like a big whiteboard and like and there's all this data or or theorized, you know. Uh, way that the company's done stuff to like justify the way that you're, the current their engineering approach. Um, I think that there's there's maybe um, th I think this is a problem that we've seen over and over again in the industry, and we continue to like try to solve it in different ways. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna t talk about three different approaches to solve the epistemological problem of software development, and uh, we're gonna walk through that, and and we're gonna be talking to ultimately kind of coming through the DevOps and continuous delivery uh, areas. But uh, first, uh, we see Agile. Um, and if you, if you look at Agile, Agile sort of says, well, we don't really know what we're building, so we're just going to build all the time. Like, we're just going to release it, we're going to release it this week, we're going to you know, release it tomorrow, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, and it sort of became that whole model of, like, we're just going to ship this stuff. And uh, that, was, that was really good, and then we started rallying around behavior-driven development, and we're like, oh, here's some, some things that we're going to... Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to all agree of like, these are the behaviors we want to do, and we're going to continue to ship it. And there's a, a kind of a grand statement, and, and you can read through uh, this quote here, but uh, really it's like, the idea is we're just trying to get to the stuff that matters. Like, we're, we're trying to answer that problem, like, what did we really come here to build, right? And we don't want to do that, that six month, uh, the roll waterfall anymore. Like, we want to do this uh, really quick, and we want to do with uh, uh, the behaviors and the interaction with our software, and like, software that people feel like is meeting their needs appropriately, and that's how, uh, people are doing that. So um, we do things like where we try to amplify the feedback loop and continue to like give people, uh, I, I don't know what's going on with you. Uh, um, but but we, we, we try to like provide that, right? It's like, so every, every whatever that meaning is with your customer, whether it's, you know, um, through, the, through your BDD specs or whatever, you're, you're regularly trying to figure out like what it is you're building and trying to do that. And in the end, like we see that like those rapid iterations win, like and we saw a complete uh, change, uh, a big shift in the industry from from that 
And I think it's important like, to remember that like, Agile is our guiding light. This has got to be the best one. So, okay. um, but I think that if we just stop at Agile, like, that's not really far enough. Like, we're not, we're not really seeing the big picture because no longer are we shipping CDs and DVDs. Um, and, and there is a completely different way that we're delivering uh, software now. Um, we're delivering software as a service. Uh, that means a lot of different things, but over the last 10, 15 years, um, we've seen a big change in how we distribute uh, software, um, how we, uh, the, the delivery cadence, um, and even the re revenue models, how we're building all this stuff. You know, we're not pricing uh, per CPU anymore or anything like that, right? We're, um, we're selling uh, time, we're selling usage of our system, we're, we're selling, um, you know, we're selling actual function of the, of the product. And, and this, this is sort of the uh, continuation of Agile into DevOps. Uh, it's sort of that natural bridge. In fact, like a lot of people who write about this, they say, yeah, you know, DevOps is, uh, is the application of Agile methodology to system administration. Um, and that's sort of the movement that we're, that we're going to. Um, you know, no deck is really complete without the words DevOps written on your hands. So it took a while for the ink to wash off, but it was worth it. So. Um, so I, uh, the important part about DevOps is that uh, um, we think about like where it came from. And, like we sort of go back to our roots and the history of it. And if you step back to 2009 at the Velocity Conference, um, there was a guy, Andrew uh, Schaefer, and he proposed a birds of a feather talk at Velocity, and he said, I'd like to talk about agile infrastructure. And, um, and it, he sort of perceived that like no one was going to show up to it, so he didn't even show up to his own birds of a feather. But this other guy, Patrick Dubois, did show up to it. And he's like, dude, where's, where's that guy? Like, he said he was going to be here, and like, he's not here. And, um, and so there was some, uh, some confusion with that. Uh, later that year, Patrick went on to uh, found, uh, found DevOps Days um, in Ghent, and then now DevOps Days happen around the world. And they are community organized uh, uh, groupings of people that are talking about uh, DevOps, um, and they happen um, you know, all over the world right now. So uh, it's kind of funny, and uh, both those guys are you know, they're good friends now, and they, they joke about that moment. Um, and uh, I, think, I think Patrick later found in the bar, he's like, dude, you, you weren't even there, you know, and so it was pretty funny. Uh, at that same talk, at that same conference, that was the first time um, that uh, that uh, John Alspa, who's now at Etsy, but uh, he was a Flickr then, and he said, "Hey, we're doing ten deploys a day," and people were just like, "What? You know, like, how could you possibly be doing ten deploys a day? We do three a year, and even then, it's you know really painful. Why would you do that? You know, you're crazy." And and there was a, a huge, huge outflow from that. Um, and this is that the first uh, DevOps days that uh, happened in Ghent in 2009. So, like I said, the slide switched around there. But I, I kind of go through that because it's it's a uh, it's a uh, DevOps is one of those things that people kind of say it's a buzzword and it's like uh, you know there's certainly people that are trying to milk it for money, but it's totally like just like random people that are trying to approach this idea of like we want we want agile to apply to the way we're delivering our software and like we're trying to make a difference in that. Um, uh, this is a long statue, so I guess you know if you're into that. Um, but uh, Gene Kim, uh, you're probably familiar with Gene, um, but he says the opposite of DevOps is despair. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's quite telling. Uh, Theo Schlossnagel says DevOps is oper operationalism of the world. Um, once software moved from being the thing you ship and just like that one instance of it to like continual operational runtime, like it's a complete shift in how you're thinking about this stuff. Um, and we, like I said earlier, it's a community movement. And it's, it all started with that whole idea of like developers are like, I want change, and operations are like, I want stability, and there's a wall of confusion, and there's other stuff over the wall. And really, like, it started with like, this is, this is kind of the way it was invoked, right? It's like, uh, uh, you've probably seen, this is now the, the DevOps girl, right? Um, and uh, yeah, but this, is, this is the driver behind why, like, why we even need DevOps, why it matters, why we care. And um, we realized that they, these, these two groups don't even know what they're doing. And I think it's a, it's a sign that there's a breakthrough between in, uniting these two groups, um, putting them together, helping them build uh, stuff together, and, and really trying to get back to that making software that matters that we talked about uh, was earlier in Agile. Um, and a lot of people that talk about DevOps really will stop at like DevOps is, is just cultural. And I think that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, Adam Jacobs says DevOps is an inclusive movement that codifies a culture. Um, and it was, it was trying to break through that, that whole wall scenario where you throw it over the wall and there's like 10 developers to one operations uh, person. 
And, and I think that, you know, a lot of times, probably in your organizations, um, I think that one of the titles, the subtitles for this talk is like, maybe you've been DevOps, like you've been sold with this thing and, and it hasn't really worked out. But it's because maybe your, your organization started out like technology first um, and didn't really go um, down the, the cultural path. And I believe the culture is going to be like one of the number one uh, reasons why DevOps succeeds in an enterprise or an organization. Um, and, and what we do in our uh, what we do in our culture is what really matters. Like um, the, the software, the technological bits, the the chefs and puppets and all that stuff in the world, like it's great. But like how we actually try to like work together and build stuff is, is the difference. So um, I mean, you probably want one of those, right? Everybody has that. That's why. No, people didn't buy enough of these. Is why SkyMall went out of business. So, so in uh, in my house, I have a I have an almost uh, three year old, and uh, we have I, I like to say that we have a moon culture in our house, and it's a little less mystic than it sounds. But um, uh, she, she's like all about the moon. Like she like knows the phases of the moon. You know, more or less. She's like crescent moon tonight. You know, or uh, uh, full moon, or where's the moon? You know, and like we talk about it. And, and it really started to be this thing. We, you know, I started telling her stories about the moon, going on a rocket ship to the moon, kind of stuff like that. And she find that you know, very entertaining. Um, but it, it sort of like started to shift in our in our house. Like now, I started. Uh, uh, I got like a little app that like tells me the phases of the moon, so I can be like, well, honey, it's 32% uh, illuminated, waning crescent, you know, and like uh, uh, that kind of business. But I started like uh, you know part, started like uh, putting uh, dashboards and things like that in place, so I actually knew well, you know how to like continue that conversation. And so we sort of had a shift, and it was kind of it's uh, kind of funny like to think about, but it's really similar in our organizations. Like the stuff we value is the stuff that we start building things around, and we start kind of uniting around. Um, I think that's a that's a really important piece. Um, there is a there's a kind of a thought that like DevOps is like the uh, the next step, no matter what, like, but I think that DevOps is the, uh, and, and this is uh, from the book on cloud computing, it's like, DevOps is the inevitable result of needing to do efficient operations in a distributed computing and cloud environment. And I think that's, you could say that DevOps is like an invention of, uh, you know, like necessity, but I think that, but I, I mean, I would say it is an invention of necessity, it's like, uh, that, that was something that we were, we were trying to approach this problem, and the ways we were doing it uh, in, in the old days, it just wasn't going to scale, right? Um, all right, here's another quote from, and I just put a lot of quotes of like, what is DevOps? Because, you know, maybe we all have different ideas of what DevOps are, but these are some of the guys who are industry leaders in the uh, DevOps space and what they, they think about it. So, uh, also, DevOps is not a tech problem, but it's a business problem. Uh, there's this great report uh, released uh, last year. I think, I don't know the actual numbers, but the links are here in the bottom. Um, but it's, I think it was like 3,000 respondents or something like that, but they, uh, they really touted this as the first scientific study of the relationship between uh, organizational performance, uh, IT performance, and DevOps practices, and, you know, if you don't want to read the whole thing, like, this is the punchline. And it's much like you would expect, right? You're like, okay, yeah, people that are actually uh, happy, people that are doing, you know, doing a job that they like and they're trying to deliver software, like, uh, that's going to improve the IT performance and the organizational performance. Uh, all right, let's see, what else? What, what else do people say about DevOps? Everybody, anybody seen this before? Culture, automation, measurement, sharing? No? Okay, all right, well, good. Uh, so, uh, uh, these, these uh, two guys that run the uh, DevOps uh, Cafe podcast, um, this is uh, Damon Edwards and John uh, Willis, but they sort of were trying to codify like, what, is, what does DevOps really mean? And so they came up with CAMS. Uh, some people have argued that like that it needs an L, so it could be CLAMS. Uh, they, want, they want Lean to go in there. We'll talk a little bit more about Lean here in a minute. Um, but I believe that when you start breaking it down, this, this, uh, this flow, it's like, hey, culture is important. And we're going to go through all these different aspects and talk about what they, what they mean and how they can, can be inside of an organization. So. Um, okay, culture influences. Uh, we we do things to like decrease. And I'm not talking like having beer or whatever. Like grabbing everybody, grab their little armadillo and like drink a Lone Star. No, this is uh, like decreasing uh, time. All right, sweet. Some people were paying attention to this guy and all stuff. Good. All right. So um, decrease the time from development to release. Uh, we need to have uh, blameless postmortems, uh, reward failure, and have high emphasis on testing. Uh, and try to unite different groups. Like do different organizational. Uh, ways to combine groups on this stuff. Uh, one of the worst things you can do 
to just like take your ops team and be like, sweet, you are now a dev ops team. And it's like, okay, uh, really? What does that mean? You know, and, and uh, um, anybody have a friend who might have worked in an organization that might have maybe done that before? Yeah, okay, great. Right. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really common. Um, and then usually people hate DevOps because of that. And so, like, right on. Like, that's, you should hate that. Um, all right, uh, so if you get to, this is like, I mean, did anybody own one of these pillows? No? It does, right? You're like, I'm in the plane, this would be great. Um, uh, if you just, yeah, it's like if you didn't worry what other people would think about you, it would just be totally cool. So, uh, anyway, so seek automation uh, to increase repeatability, that's what we're, we're talking about here with automation. And this, like, this uh, slide could be like five slides long. Um, I'm sure like you guys probably could just, we could probably like sit here for 30 minutes and like not repeat and continue to name like automation and DevOps tools, right? And then we just have a huge list there. Um, but the idea is that we're moving away from manual uh, configuration. We're not doing that anymore. Um, we're not proposing like, you know, we have this magical software solution that's going to be it, but like we're going to unite our tooling around kind of our, our culture and, um, and go that, that direction. Um, we're going to do measurement, and we're going to measure the stuff that we, that we care about, um, and we're going to measure the things that, uh, that are important to like, our, our culture and to like, actually building the stuff at uh, operational runtime. This is a little uh, dashboard um, trimmed down here. And this is just uh, at the start of my work at, like, this is how many deploys in the last day. Um, we did six deploys to stage and five deploys to prod, and um, I guess some of us are here at the conference, so that's why it's a little low. But like, did you kind of see, like, Here's the number of, here's, here's how the software rolls out, here's the intervals when it's rolling out, here's how long they're generally taking. We can start building dashboards and kind of getting metrics around this kind of thing. And it helps us see like what's what's going on. We can start correlating like code commits to builds to deploys and we start having like a bigger picture of what's going on on our, on our stack. Um, okay, so uh, st stuff like uh, for sharing, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of things you could say about sharing. Um, some people talk about sharing, about like coming to conferences and talking about it. Some people talk about you know building dashboards that everybody, everybody can get to, um, um, building you know letting people compose the data and their views for their own, their own way. Like, I think that's really important. Um, we, we use a uh, we use bots a lot in our uh, in our chat system. So like whenever um, you know we have Jenkins bots and deploy bots and uh, like all sorts of different stuff, and we're able to to see that. But everybody from, you know, you don't have to be like writing the actual code to see like what's going on in the system because it's like, um, you know, the little bot is knocking, narking somebody out or, or showing, you know, saying what's going on in the system. Or, you know, kind of. um, there's a lot more on DevOps. We're going to move into continuous delivery, but if you haven't read this book, The Phoenix Project, I would totally recommend it. Um, I don't like wholeheartedly recommend any books, but it was, uh, uh, it was it's a really good book. It's a rewrite of The Goal, if anybody's familiar with The Goal from like the 80s. Uh, which took a lot of like uh, lean and, and um, kind of manufacturing wisdom and uh, co-divided for people that were kind of in, in that space. Uh, but it's it's like that, but it's with IT and it's super well done. Um, and it's a good entertaining read, so uh, hope hope you enjoy that. All right, let's get into uh, continuous delivery. You guys all have one of these suitcases, right? Skateboard suitcase, totally. Yeah. Um, that sounds awesome. You know, the more you look at the SkyMall stuff, you're like, I could totally use that. That would be really cool. Um, all right, so it's it's not really how much, um, it's not really how often you deliver, but really how little you can deliver at any one point. Um, which may sound kind of uh, different, but like we're trying to get to a small batch size. Um, and we're trying to build our pipeline so everything's a sequential, you know, from, from build uh, to test to, uh, uh, to deploy, right? We're kind of going down that, that pipeline. Uh, so, like I said, we're doing like a batch size of one, which is one of those things that like the lean and the Kanban and all those folks really believe in. And um, the old way of thinking about this, and I've worked in organizations where it's like this, it's like when we change the Oracle database, everything will, you know, die, right? And so we don't do it but once every six months or a year, and, um, and it's just like flurry of activity trying to prepare for that, that one moment and it, it always goes wrong. Um, and so now instead we're saying, okay, changes are, 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 they are bad. Yeah, they actually break stuff. But if you put them into small little changes over time, like you'll be able to catch the one change that was bad, you'll fix that. Um, it's, it's a completely different way of, of doing, uh, doing things. Um, it also helps because we say, all right, you gotta deploy your own stuff. And so we have a deploy button 
Um, it's not a cool hardware button, but I think you should build one. Uh, but uh, it is, there's, you, know, you just go to the website, you say deploy, and every developer is you know, in charge of, uh, uh, of you know, putting their deploy out. And we have uh, enough patterns. Like, so some of the patterns you do in, in continuous delivery, uh, you make sure you don't pass your defects on to the next step. Um, your goal is not, uh, it's not necessarily to um, make it faster, but it's making it easier for people to do it, right? And some of that will end up being like speed. Like, so how do you increase the flow? Um, I mentioned how we like use the bots to, to troll the users. Um, and we, and so it basically just like, it's like, hey, your, our tier is, is off, like our, it's main version, uh, ver version, so we need to like go ahead and like, you know, deploy that. Um, and then we allocate time to enhance the build, test and deploy system, so we actually dedicate our engineering resources to help fix that up. Um, let's see, uh, this is one that people talk about is, you write software and you leave it sitting in the code repo for a month or whatever before you deploy it, like you've actually, you've actually put some, uh, a lot of latency in that code, some technical debt, and now it's like to go back like whenever it gets deployed. And if you're living in like the continuous delivery world, you're like totally, I get that. But if, uh, if you're not, like this is just like kind of making a shift uh, away from this uh, technical debt is like it's pretty huge. So this kind of, that's like the history of like where we've come, where the industry is, and it's like complete hand wavy, my opinion uh, only. So, uh, um, but if you kind of buy that, and you're willing to go with that, I think we can say the next uh, the next arc uh, that, that needs to get brought into the DevOps uh, movement is secure. And you look at, uh, and, and I actually say, maybe we should even just call it rugged because um, security has become toxic a lot of times. But um, either way, like it's the same, same idea because you end up with this, you have a friend who maybe once said this, no hands? Okay, got some hands back there, yeah. Okay, everybody knows that, right? And, okay, hey, has everybody ever heard that? You know, and then as a security person, how does it make you feel? Like, like my first week on a job, on a job uh, with uh, some some guys, they told me this, and I was like, "Wait, then we don't get paid. Like, that would be bad. Like, we need we need to make money off this, right?" Uh, and uh, um, but it's sort of like it's like you don't think I'm a complete idiot, right? Like, uh, but but as a security person, you feel that you feel like, well, they they think that I'm just like a huge hater and I hate them and they hate me and now it's just this problem. Um, and I think there's there's cultural unrest, um, and but you know some of it's natural. Like we're driven with uh, with different things. Like uh, security's uh, sort of traditionally been kind of going down this track of, of audit and PCI and SOX and yada yada. Um, and I want to read this because I, I think this is really uh, to me this states the real problem. Um, risk assessment introduces a dangerous fallacy that structured inadequacy is almost as good as adequacy that underfunded security efforts plus risk management are about as good as properly funded uh, security work. Does that, does that resonate with you? Does that, does that bother you? That's what bothers two people. Good, three, okay, three. Okay, can I have five? No. It bothers you, right? Right? Um, and I think that it, it, is, uh, it, it is a problem. And like, we, don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to just say, oh, well, we'll accept the risk and whatever. We actually want to get back to doing security engineering. And we find ourselves in a similar problem. Like um, most uh, shops will have like 100 developers to 10 operations to like the one security person. And and as the flow goes that way, like the hatred builds. And so, uh, and, and, oh yeah, I mean it's true, right? And, and we've all felt that. And uh, and rightly so. Like 100 to one ratio is not exactly a fair ratio, right? And I, you know, it's like we can't review all the code that 100 people wrote. I'm one person. Like, that's impossible. Um, and so then security starts saying things like, oh no, we can't do that, we become a blocker. And then the business units that, that are doing like uh, continuous delivery, they're like, well, we're pushing stuff out like 10 times a day, and you guys review it once a year, I don't know, whatever, it's your, your problem. And then, and then there's more hatred and, and all that stuff. So, um, okay, security tools, uh, a lot of times they run out of band, uh, they're confusing, uh, you know, kind of like that, right? And then usually when they're done, they end up, you end up getting this like lovely, uh, PDF, right? And, and, and it's like 473 pages, uh, and you're like, what am I going to, I've never read anything that's 473 pages. I really was working on saying epistemological properly, right? So, um, uh, but I, I think that, I think the tide is changing. I think like we are actually seeing, we are actually in a moment that uh, is going to be really important going forward. Um, and uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know what that means. 
But there is the idea of realism. I don't know. I, you know, I was just like, where can I put this one? It's too funny not to put. So, um, but the idea that we're like trying to like look towards resiliency and people like hold up in Netflix, you know, is like, okay, they they do mean stuff inside of their system. Like that's really good. And people start like kind of uh, like drawing near to that. And, like you, you hear so many talks about that because it strikes it strikes closer to the engineering uh, work that we want to do instead of that whole idea of like, okay, we'll just accept that like we may fail. Or whatever. And um, we get to the idea of rugged. And I'm, I'm from Texas. Um, oh, actually, I'm not originally from Texas, but I've lived there for like 11 years now. And um, in our grocery store, um, we sell we sell Ziploc bags. They're ATB. So if you're from Texas, people love ATB, which is really kind of a weird thing. Um, but they're Texas tough, right? So I, I don't know. Like I'm like, what does that even mean? But it's like this romanticized idea of like what it means to be Texas and your plastic bags that will hold stuff. You know, and and um, and they sell like people people want it, right? You're like, I mean, you can just write Texas tough on anything, and it's like people will say, yeah, that sounds good. I'll take five of those. Um, and, and I found this. Uh, I found the rugged software uh, movement. Um, Jeff Williams, who's here at the conference, uh, was part of that. Uh, Josh Corman, David Rice. Uh, I'm just going to read just two two little uh, short excerpts from the rugged manifesto. Although the whole thing is like you know uh, 100 words long as it is. Um, but it starts resonating with that idea of like how do we approach uh, security and can we do it differently and can we do it in a way that's more akin to the Netflix model of like doing mean stuff and like uh, and building engineering to that instead of the uh, kind of the uh, security blocker type model. Um, and so here's two here's two excerpts. So I am rugged and more importantly my code is rugged. I recognize the software has been become the foundation of our modern world. I recognize the awesome responsibility that comes with this foundational role. Um, and I'm rugged because my code can face. Oh, sorry. And I'm rugged because my code can face these challenges and persist in spite of it. So that sort of like captures what we see in like the Netflix thing or whatever. Um, here's some here's some links for you to look at, or if you're if you're interested in the idea of like rugged or where rugged intersects with DevOps, because you know, I see a lot of overlap in the, in the communities. Um, but it's where you have stuff that's repeatable, it's reliable, reviewable, uh, rapid, uh, resilient, reduced attack surface. Um, we do this uh, rugged, uh, rugged podcast. Uh, have a donor for Christmas and things. We're off. We need to really get back on that uh, for this year. But um, we start breaking down to like all the itties, right? It's like defensibility, availability, recoverability. We started trying to bucket all these into like meaningful categories and like how do we start uh, looking at that? We've interviewed different people, um, both from software uh, industry and from other industries. Like, what does that mean in your industry? Um, I got a good friend who's a, a plumber who I keep trying to like get on the show. Um, but like, uh, you really have to think about some of these things whenever you're, you're like dealing with the water. Like, the, like if it gets uh, uh, if it gets spoiled or whatever, like people die, right? And so, um, and I, we don't have that same uh, we don't have the same gravity when you deal with software, right? We, we don't we don't always treat it that way. And I started thinking through this, and, and the more we've talked about it, and we've brought different people on the show, and we keep kind of coming around the same idea of like, if it's not about quality and transparency. Uh, and, and really creating value inside of the organ organization and kind of a cultural infusion, like it's just not going to work. Like these are the kind of things that, that are the, the things that will shift. And so we're continuing to explore it. So uh, it's been a fun fun kind of podcast to do and work on. But um, I also want to leave you some talks that I think that are, are really good. Something that like uh, you know go watch these in your own time. I think they're really fun. Uh, this was at the AppSec USA. It was like uh, two two and a half years ago, uh, and this is the uh, the famous. Uh, uh, Twitter talk about doing security automation at Twitter. Um, this, is a, this is a great talk, and, uh, and we were really uh, stoked to have it um, at, uh, at in Austin. Uh, Zane Lackey uh, gave a great talk with Dan over at uh, Velocity. Um, and I, I work with Zane, but I had this talk. I had, I've, I've always liked this talk before I work with Zane, so it's not like I'm like, oh yeah, Zane, you're so awesome. Uh, you are really awesome, Zane. Zane. So. Um, there's, there's a great talk by uh, this guy, Gareth, Gareth uh, Rushko, on security monitoring tools. Um, and uh, Gareth works over at Puppet now, um, but he's over in, uh, over in London. Uh, and then uh, Matt Conda uh, gave a good talk on insecure expectations, so right in uh, testing uh, around uh, security stuff. Okay, so now we're gonna actually get into the tooling part of the talk. And, like, we're gonna go through a couple examples and things that might be, might be useful for you. Um, and so we're, just to like say it again, like we're using tooling to influence our culture, right? We're, we're trying to influence the way we do automation, we do measurement and sharing. Um, these are the ways we're trying to like build this stuff up. Um, 
the types of scanning and testing that you can do, uh, I think probably everybody in here is probably familiar with this, uh, but it's all the way from static code analysis um, uh, to dynamic stuff, where you're doing vir vir uh, virus scanning or code signing, uh, business logic and flow stuff. Um, all these are different, and they're not like, you can't replace, uh, I've heard a couple talks today, it's like you can't replace penetration testing, that's not the idea. Um, but it would be really great if we could start to automate some of our security attacks and do it in a way that is the currency of the other developers in our organization. Um, and I really like the uh, the Riot Games talk where they're like, yeah, we just like ask people like what's really going on with them. And we like just showed up and shut up for like an hour. I'm like, that's pretty helpful, right? Because what's the, what's the, um, and, and I think he said something like, uh, I, I don't want to put stuff on the, uh, on a Word doc or a PDF, right? It's like put it in the wiki and the systems where people already go for learning and like already go for education. So if you could already start building like tests and like putting the tests in the pipeline or putting tests in their build systems, like that really makes a, a big difference. So wouldn't it be nice if we could do that? And we think so. Um, you could start saying things like, the login page on my application should not be vulnerable to SQL injection. That would be, that would be good. And I think that's something that like a person who's not a security person would be like, I don't know what SQL injection is, but it sounds bad, so agreed, right? Um, the search page should not be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Again, I don't know what it is, but it says vulnerable, and XSS sounds really bad, so again, I don't want it. Um, we should not have backdoors in our applications, or whatever it is that you, that you kind of think about. When you start thinking of, in terms of that uh, kind of cross boundaries, um, you, want to, you want to work yourself out of the hundred to one to start finding like, you know, people in the hundred that could kind of start doing the work for you, right? Um, I have a project that I work on called Gauntlet. It wraps uh, Cucumber um, and it does this kind of testing. So um, it does integration tests, uh, meets uh, di dynamic application security testing. And uh, here's kind of some like quick uh, uh, selling points for uh, Gauntlet or it's our philosophy. It's like, it comes with pre canned steps that hook security testing and tooling uh, functions inside of your continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. Um, it always tries to be a good uh, citizen of standard air, standard exit, um, or exit status and standard out. And uh, but Gauntlet doesn't install any tools, not a package manager, doesn't do anything. It really only lightly wraps uh, Cucumber, right? And so really it's su super fair to just be like security plus Cucumber equals Gauntlet, which is kind of the idea of what we're going for. And uh, it's really simple uh, logic. Uh, it's, you kind of are given some given steps, some when and then, right? And it's like, uh, this is, this is uh, using the Gherkin uh, language here. Um, and they look real, real similar to this. So at the top we have, uh, in, the feature is inmap attacks for example.com. And given we have inmap installed and we have the following host, example.com, uh, when I launch an inmap attack, uh, the output uh, should contain you know, this and it should not contain uh, this other stuff. Right. It should not have a mail server open on there, right? Um, we, we have some different people that use uh, Gauntlet, uh, from Netflix to uh, PagerDuty, uh, Cab Forward. Um, there's a uh, company that's doing like consulting for military stuff that's using it. Um, so it's cool. Um, the and, and, and more people are using it than that, but uh, there's a lot of different uh, attack tooling that's inside of it. Uh, we could totally use more to be added to it. Um, all right, so I'm guessing you guys are kind of familiar with this list, but like there's some web scanners and some network scanners and some SQL injections, or SQL map, right? And so um, we kind of wrap all those. Um, but it tries to get around the problem statement of like, okay, well, how do you know SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and fuzzing, um, information leakage. Um, and so if you want to just ignore all that, you can just say, we're just trying to automate attack tooling. And, but more so, like we believe that we're trying to uh, facilitate collaboration between those different groups. So the 100 and the 10 and the 1 can start kind of having meaningful conversations that are not just hateful. Um, and so uh, there's some information on how to get, get a hold of Gauntlet or do different things with it. Um, but I have a, I have a demo, um, uh, entire demo pipeline that you can look at, and so we're going to go through some of that. Um, this looks pretty cool, right? You can see yourself using one of these things. Yeah? Somebody in the back owns too, right? Um, all right, so we're going to look at a, a fully functioning attacking pipeline. Uh, so you can start out and uh, and fork this repo. Um, and again, like we'll just kind of buzz through the slides, and then um, you can grab this on your own and look through it. Well, that's kind of like washed out, isn't it? Is that pretty hard to see back there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So um, I'll try to talk through it a little bit. But there's the uh, Rails Travis example. 
uh, and into the secure pipeline project. We're actually going to look at two two different uh, repos inside there. One's going to be a Jenkins thing, and this one's hooked inside of Travis. Uh, Travis is like a uh, it's free if you're doing open source projects. So you can just uh, you can fork this, get a Travis account, and like you're up in business with like your uh, your entire build pipeline with the Rails app with the tests already running uh, in like three minutes or something like that. It's pretty pretty fun to like do and hack on. So um, the labs inside of there are in, inside of uh, slash velocity. I'm going to show you the three files. Oh, this one came out a little better. So um, I'll show you the three files that uh, that kind of like stitch this all together. So Travis has a, uh, a YAML file, which is it's like uh, instruction set. And so there's all this stuff like before it, the actual install, do this business, before the script. And then here's the actual uh, test script that we want to run. So up top, you, uh, I'll just read out a couple so you can see in the back, but it says like install nmap, um, install like some SSL libraries, and uh, install SSLIs. Um, before the before the script runs, we're actually going to start up our application. So there's this little like set token business, but like uh, we do a rake uh, rake for the database uh, startup, and then we start up Rails. Um, and then there's there's the the uh, actual Gauntlet attacks are wrapped wrapped inside of a rake file, but um, I try to give them like meaningful names in here. So there's like network attack, SSL attack, uh, cross site scripting. Uh, there's a gem file that, that ships with this, so you gotta you just gotta bundle when you first get it if you want to do it on your on your local uh, machine as well. Um, and we just require a couple versions in there. Um, uh, the reason why I show this here is like Arachne, you know, could be installed in that other piece, but we're actually installing the gem file. So um, yeah, so let's see. And then the script uh, actually executes the uh, the different rake tasks, and here's the rake file. That's what I was going to show. Um, and each one of those is real simple, right? It's like Gauntlet dot slash test it attacks, XSS attack, um, and then when you open up uh, the cross-site scripting attack, uh, it looks much like that file that we saw earlier, the, the given win then logic, but it's uh, up top. You know, given we have Arachne, um, make sure that we want, uh, and we have this, uh, we have this uh, website uh, loaded, so we're on localhost uh, port 3000 uh, slash user slash password slash new, and um, we want to say that if we do cross-site scripting against that endpoint, um, we should find uh, zero issues were detected. And then uh, also below, there's the same thing, uh, but it's the users uh, to the signup page. So we're not doing like a full scan where we just like, you know, filter break the entire site and, and do that. That's going to take hours, right? And that's not going to be useful for your uh, CI or computer server type thing. Um, but we're saying, okay, just look at this one page, and now one page, and now I have cross-site scripting on it. And so we're like being more uh, discreet. I think that's, uh, that's really important because a lot of these security tools can run for days, right? And then, uh, and it'd be super annoying that way. Um, and so you'll still need to do the running for days bit, but once you find the thing, you program it in here, and then you're, ready, you're, you're off to get it out of it. Uh, okay, same thing for sign-up page. Um, there's a, they also have like a module called uh, Backdoor, so they check like random like uh, PHP scripts and other things like that. Um, I just did this because it was, uh, just like, it's just like there's different pieces of the tools, and we're just pulling out different ones of them uh, to try to run. All right, uh, okay, here's a SQL map example. Um, I won't roll through this whole thing, but uh, same idea. We're attacking the new password page uh, with SQL map. Um, and you know, if you've used SQL map before, you know that like, it, it definitely can run for a really long time. So you really gotta scope down the parameters and try to like find it. But you know, you actually know what your application runs, so you don't have to run this like find which database. You're like, I know which database I'm running, right? And so it's like, you don't have to uh, spend a lot of time with that. Um, I think, I think Zane said in one of his talks, and I really liked it, but it's like uh, uh, a lot of times we see home field advantage uh, to, to other people. But it's like, we, we know what our stuff is running, so why not like write in gear stuff that's, that's for them? So um, yeah, so some of the thing, other things we're working on is a uh, Gauntlet Docker container so that, uh, uh, so that, so that you, know, you don't have to install Ruby and all that other stuff, and you can just be like, here's your container, give it an instruction set, let it run. Um, there's some work being done on putting that into the Kali uh, Linux distro. Um, I think I still have a few more minutes, right? That wasn't like the go bell, was it? We're good on time. Okay, okay, good. Uh, okay, so, but wait, there's more. All right, good. Um, maybe use Jenkins, and um, and here's an example of like how to do a secure pipeline using Jenkins. Um, also, this is in uh, this is in that repo. It's the same uh, organization, but just the Jenkins uh, example repo. And I won't talk through the whole thing, um, but we have. To, oh man, that, that is pretty bad. So let's see. Uh, the top, the top one is a uh, breakman check. Um, 
The next one is known vulnerabilities. Uh, yeah, then there's a uh, like a, a third, a fourth one down. There's like a run OWASP zap on it. There's a virus scan at the very bottom. Um, and then you can use stuff like Jenkins Flow um, to sort of do this sort of stuff in parallel because you're like, well, I know these some of these take like a long time, or you know, um, whether it has a virus or not doesn't change that I still want to do unit testing on it or whatever. So you kind of like you don't have to put all these in serial, and so it kind of lets you compose. Um, your build process like that. Um, a lot of people hate Jenkins, and sometimes it's because of stuff like this. Um, so you know, be careful like that you don't take the build, you know, and just change it so it's like running. Um, oh shoot, got plenty of time. Um, you don't want to change the build so it's like running for like uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes. You know, people people really frown on that, right? So and okay, so this is the last thing that I'll I'll show here, and then we can do maybe some questions if we have some time. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with Zap. Uh, which is the Z attack proxy, there is a uh, command line wrapper for it called Zapper uh, that Gareth wrote, uh, uh, was doing this, did the security monitoring talk I mentioned earlier. Um, and, it, and it does something like this. You can just say, um, you know, Zapper attack and uh, give it a website and it starts uh, proliferating all that. And then you can say, if you don't want to see, uh, you know, re reflected cross-site scripting the uh, results, you know, and say that it has risk high. But it starts like letting you put these, the tool chain that you're using for penetration testing or other things like that inside your build your, and your dev uh, processes. So. All right, so uh, these are the slides, um, if you want to get them. It's uh, devops-appsec-cali on uh, Bitly. And uh, yeah, sure, yeah. All right, um, so it's really easy to get discouraged in our industry, but I think there is hope. I think we've seen through the path of uh, agile, DevOps, and continuous delivery that there's a huge shift going on in the organization, and we actually have an opportunity to play, to play a big part of that. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, uh, we, we, it's it's going to be really important that we add value and add value in the right places, um, and, uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's important, but I think that if done right, it can totally happen. Um, Two places where I think you can really make a huge win is the, the build pipeline influencing that um, and the operational tooling uh, that goes along with it. Uh, and make sure that you're actually thinking and getting your, your teams to think about like not just doing integration testing and unit testing because, um, and then start thinking about like, how you do attack tooling because um, you know now you're saying against this, uh, this script that anybody on the internet could download, like, you should be able to run that on our website, on this page, and it sh we should not be vulnerable to that, right? And that seems like pretty logical. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's one of those things that as security uh, domain experts, like, that, you know, we'll have to shepherd our organizations through because we're kind of going through that process. So. Anyways, uh, I think that's, that's it. Um, but does anybody have any questions or, or comments on that? Yeah. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a generic command line adapter, and so we default to the command line. So you can, um, uh, which you know, Gauntlet itself is not secure. Don't you know, right? it's like uh, it, it uh, it's pretty open there. Uh, but it'll execute uh, whatever you give it on the command line, and you can do that. We have some uh, Python wrappers for um, from like the SSLI stuff and any like Python scripts that you want to put in there. Um, so a lot, even some of the hooks for some of the applications are not super deep, but um, anything that has uh, like if you want to make sure it's inside your path, that it's installed correctly, that you have the right version, that you have the right libraries, stuff like that. Like those are the kind of things to, like to get a hook in there. But you could totally use the generic adapter, work on it for a little while, and then um, you know if you really like what you're doing and your flow for that, you could say, hey, I want to add this to the main, and like that would that'd be really cool. So yes, the answer is yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could you explain that a little bit more?
Yeah, yeah. I think that's a tough one. Um, I think you're. You know, I haven't, I haven't had to do that, so I can't like say like, oh yeah, here's the way you should do that. Um, I, I do think that, like for your well, for your system that you're acquiring and you're, that you're working with, like, are you writing code that goes along with that as well? Like, are you building models or whatever? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. So that's, yeah, maybe it's a little different question or I didn't think about it properly the first time. But yeah, so um, it's important that the developers, uh, you know, do pager, like they, they get the pager, operations pager, just like everybody else does. Um, we, we really focus, like a lot of organizations that I see that do DevOps, um, the right way, um, or you know, the team to have a lot of success with it, um, will will take uh, their teams and say like, you you are now responsible for this thing. You know, and you're not responsible for just shipping the, the one piece, right? You're responsible for entire end to end life cycle, customer engagement, uh, and total customer experience with the product. And so, um, I don't. You know, it seems like you, you know that's the organizational shift that a lot of people have done. That like that's the, the way the process they went through. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Okay. So wait, so they're building I got you. Okay, yeah. I think some of that happens naturally, like from the um, just from capitalism. You know, it's like we we require like you to do this. You know, play ball the way we want to play ball. Um, yeah, I, I, um, back you know four or five years ago, you know, a lot of times I do uh, calls with vendors, and it was always like, yeah, do you have an API? No, okay, you know, and like that was just that was the it. You know, and you ended up kind of having to have that, that answer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's a um, that is a hard problem to, to span, right? Because then you start like um, uh, I know some um, some companies in Austin that have kind of done some different approaches on this, and uh, one is like you know you have like a uh, a person who's kind of like goes to the different teams and is like you know shepherding those different processes and helping them happen. But part of it is um, allowing the uh, the team that's building the software like to pick their own tools that they want to build and how they want to support it and all that stuff. So um, yeah, it's, it's like that's that's a mixed uh, mixed thing. I uh, I'm trying to think about who's who's done that really well. Um, yeah, I, I don't really I, can, I don't have any like great answers for you because it's like most of the teams will. Um, you know, when, when they start going down that path of um, segmenting like this this group over here, and this group over here, it starts feeling like there's going to be some overlap in, in systems. And maybe there's just some like good synergies or, well, synergy, that's a great word, right? But maybe there's like some like uh, where you get groups together and you can kind of say, okay, we're, we're both doing this like ticket management system. It would make sense for us to kind of align you know, together. Or we're both using the same, uh, um, you know, operational, uh, you know, monitoring system or something like that. I'm trying to align on that. Uh, most of the people that, I've, that have struggled with that is where they start, you know, um, everybody starts choosing their own individual, their, choose their own adventure kind of path, and then they wake up six months later and they're like, what, what have we done? Like, now we have really disparate uh, systems. And um, so sometimes there's, there's like a, a need for like that oversight of like what we're doing inside our organization and not just kind of building out these complete separate 
um, groups because you're kind of making a new type of silo in that sense, and like that's not super healthy either. So, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of DevOps questions. I want to let people know that I got uh, scheduled here on February 9th, February 22nd. We have all this time to go to get in. Thirty five bucks and on Friday we have a whole devops day. So please come if you're interested more in more devops. I've got a booth down there, you can pick out at the URL, I've got the discount code, thirty-five bucks if you want on Pastor Manager, commission, LAX also. Yeah. yeah, cool, yeah. Yeah, so that's like right here in, in town, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, to totally, totally same. Yeah, same. No, uh, yeah, no, no real, no market difference. Oh, it's all good stuff. Like it's all the same, same idea. It's the same approach, same idea, same. Thing. I don't make any money off of rugged DevOps or anything like that or whatever. So it's not like I you guys don't care. It's just the idea of like we do have an opportunity. Uh, and I think a lot of people are seeing that there's that opportunity, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. And even the guys with those other, uh, even people that are like saying uh, DevSecOps or DevOpsSec or whatever, like uh, same thing. I don't think anybody's, nobody's like, you know, getting piles of cash off that, right? It's like it's just uh, it's something we believe in, and we're just all talking about it in maybe slightly different language, but totally the same thing. Yeah. We should, we should, uh, maybe we should. Yeah. I mean, we, we sort of do. I mean, like, I, I know those guys who talk, so um, I'll adapt the slides to focus on that. Any other questions? Yeah? What about the idea that the debt is off the old the You said they make the off the the off the the access, the 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 yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I guess my point is like, yeah. there is no DevOps role. Like, the, yeah. there is no like DevOps is not is not a is not a person or a role or whatever. It's just like um, it is a it's it's the new way that we're trying to accomplish the you know our mission. So, um, and, and I think that. Uh, your point about rotation is that really, like everybody, really should be kind of playing playing ball with this. Like that's uh, that's how you kind of you know build this up. So. All right, well, we should probably uh, cut on time. I'll, I'll stick around here if anybody has any other questions or um, you're like that was that was horrible. Thank you for not asking a question without yeah. saying that. But you can go tell me that. Thanks. I'm gonna like get these all to you now. Hey, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. All right. You are. Nice. Cool. All right. Hey, let's see. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your question.